So we're with Dick Leonard at his home in Llanelli. Dick, ex, well not ex, still with man really, officially isn't it? Well, sort of. Sort of. Um, Dick, just take us on a little bit of a journey. Uh, I was born in Glanguilly Hospital in Camarillon, but we lived in first in Nathan Street down by the, the uh, with my grandparents uh, down Seaside in Lely. Yeah. And then we moved up to Ronde Terrace, which is regarded as somewhat a bit of crachach. So, Mum and Dad, what were they doing? My dad was a, a kennel manager. He uh, used to work for um, this rich woman, uh, Miss Roberts, who ran Bevan and Roberts, the, the uh, ironmongers in Thinet. And Dad went to work there um, in charge of their fleet of... Yeah. Um, well, he started out with horses. And then they, they, they were mechanised and he, he took over that. And he was a great mechanic as well. So, where did you go to school, primary school? Harvard Road. You enjoyed that primary school? Did, were you doing music there with anyone? No, no, Nothing no. Nothing like that? No. My mother made me take piano lessons and I hated it. Right. I learnt all of it without realising that it, it would come in handy one day. So you read music as well? No. I can read music very, very slowly. Not at... Not at playing pace. If you give me some music, give me a day and I'll, I'll, I'll get through it. Okay. But other than that, no. So you left have a draw at secondary school, you went to boys' grammar? Clearly boys' grammar school, yeah. And what was that, like a bit strict, different? No. Once, well, I suppose it was strict, but I tried to ignore that. Mm. And it was just, it was, yeah, it was all my mates were there. It was because it was I didn't take it seriously. No. So I never was academically kind of blessed. Uh, and I was just c kind of winging it all the way through. So were you listening to music at that time? You know, what what kind of stuff were you into? No, not really. I was just, music was uh, something I thought I had to go through. You know, parents want a, want a well-rounded child. And so I thought, well, that's why they're doing it. But I, would, I didn't particularly like it until I got a copy of the Dambusters March. Da, 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 and I went and, and then the stuff on top of the piano would be shaking and I'd give it to full welly. Yeah. And um, I only realised how how handy the piano playing was when I heard a Jerry Lee Lewis record and I thought, this is a rock and roll star and he's playing the piano. Okay, hey. yeah. So So was Jerry Lee then that did well, a bit of a no, yeah, but this was this was a little way down there. Elvis was the first one yeah. for me. Yeah. And then and that's when I went out and saved my money for Christmas. I ordered all my relatives to give me money instead of presents one Christmas and I bought a guitar. And when I, I was Fourteen, something like that. And we should say you named yourself Deke after one of the characters in Elvis's film. In as well. Elvis's film, yes. I thought nobody's going to be a rock star with a name like Roger. <laughs> yeah, Rog. I don't know Roger Waters, Roger Daltrey. Exactly. Yeah, but I didn't see that coming. See? <laughs> but Roger Leonard, it just seemed kind of yeah. Didn't so, wasn't rock and roll enough. So Deke, when did you name yourself Deke then? After I saw the Elvis Presley oh, right, film okay. Loving You, I thought. Oh, yeah, I'm going to call myself Dick Roger. When he pans, he's a call Roger. <laughs> so that was, yeah. that was, well, then when I we started playing, yeah. everybody was calling me Dick anyway. Crackers, talk us through a little bit about that. Uh, purely chance, because my cousin, when I went to the grammar school, I sat next to this guy and we got on great. Uh, his name was Mike Reese, 
And um, after about six months sitting next to me, he said, you know I'm your cousin, didn't you? And I said, no, I didn't know. a band together. We didn't get a band together, we just played together. We yeah. both got guitars. And then we met Jeff Griffiths, who um his father owned a pub. I can't remember the name of it now. He came up to us one day, he was a year below us, so we didn't take him seriously. Um uh, but he said, I'm a drummer, I hear you're playing guitars and stuff like that. Would you know, do you want to form a band? Mm. So we said yeah and we thought, well well He's probably terrible, but when we got, got to his pub, he said, rehearse in my pub. Uh, so we went up, and he was terrific, because his his uncle had been a cabaret player, and he had taught him all the rudiments, and he was a great drummer, mm. terrific drummer. So, and it all happened on Mike's birthday, and we were up in Mike's house, just having a jam, and... Um, the neighbour knocked on the door and he said, I heard you playing um, some music. And we said, yeah, that's right. He said, well, I run the um, Car Bay Club, which is a club of the um, power station down, oh, yeah. down in Berryport. Yeah. And he said, well, would, would you do a gig? And we said, yes. So we got there and it was, it started out as a disaster because we didn't realise we had half had to have electric guitars. So once we started playing, all we could hear was the drums. So and it was really embarrassing and it was full of people and they're all average age, about fifty, sixty. And we were playing and you couldn't all you could hear was the drums and I thought I don't want to do this. This is terrible, this is ghastly. And then out of the corner of my eye I saw movement and I turned around and Mike had gone into all these kind of Gene Vincent moves and all that sort of stuff and he was kind of, he took his coat off and he waved it around his head like the, we'd seen Joey D and the Starlight as doing. And we went down an absolute storm, it was terrible, but he was lewd. Yeah. The Dream was the first psychedelic band we were in, that's yeah. when Psychedelia came in and we, we, we heard there was a thing called a freak out and we didn't know what it was, so we just, at gigs we used to go arrive early and pick all the flowers in the neighbourhood and throw them all over the stage and I don't, it wasn't a freak out, I didn't, we didn't know what a freak out was but Frank Zapp had mentioned one so we assumed he knew what he was talking about. So so it sounds like you were sort of, um, it sounds like you were um, metamorphosizing from this you know, rock and roll beginnings yeah. into experiment. Yeah. Uh, you're yeah. finding your way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're becoming an artist of, in, in your own right, and you're you're looking at stamping, making your own stamp on on the music. World. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, by then we were we were hungry, yes. Yeah. And because we were thought we were good, and we were. The bands in in Swansea, and Llanelli, and in the area at the time that were real cracking bands, you know. Okay, I'm going to use my Elvis Costello plectrum, <laughs> right? Given to me by the man himself. Where did you meet him, Andy? Oh, I know Elvis. We, we did. I was writing a book once. That's when I met him first with a guy called John Eichler about um, pub rock, and um, we interviewed Elvis, uh, and we did. We used to go, we used to know Jake Riviera, his manager, so we were always calling in the office and uh, Elvis was usually there, so... think looking at people like uh, you know Crosby, Stills, Nash and Young and all that kind of stuff at that era right, it was roughly the same time had you sort of made your way out there like um, you know some of the some of the artists at that, that time because that was the kind of way you were going wasn't it yeah west coast American so yeah yeah 
do you think, do you, looking back, do you think you should have gone or, or were you? We didn't have a choice at the time because nobody went. Nobody went to America and I made it for, well, if they did, I never, never came across them. So, because there was no channel to go through for that. And we were just local bands, really. We may have been good, but we were just local bands, you know what I mean? And let's see what a record out. And we didn't have a record out. You could, there's no point in going to, they wouldn't, have, they wouldn't have even considered you. Were you aware of the likes of, um, you know, those kind of, the doors, for instance, you oh, were yeah. well aware of, yeah, of what yeah, they yeah, were doing yeah. at the time. Yeah, but we we tended towards Quicksilver. Um, Quicksilver really was, was the main influence on us, and you can hear it in the music. Yeah. first formation of man and when did that happen well they were already going as the bystanders yeah so when they offered me the job I assumed it was the bystanders I was joining so I was telling everybody hey I'm joining the bystanders because they were a class act as well great Mickey Jones and guitar he said whoa and singing four part harmonies they were, they were the only band really kind of nailed that mm -hmm. And they were, they, were, they were just terrific. So when I went up to join them in London, I said, oh, I'm in the bystanders. And she said, no, you're not, you're in man. I said, oh, man, I don't like that. So, so um, then Ray, the bass player, said, yeah, but it's such a small word, it'll look really big on the posters. And I thought, okay, fair enough. Mm. And where did you tour in, in, in the beginning then? Where were you sort of gigging? It was... The Benelux countries in Germany, really. That's where we started. And looking at that now, straight away, looking at to Germany, the Beatles with Hamburg and so on, but also they have this love, they have this understanding of psychedelic electro music, don't they? They were way ahead of us. You yeah, know, they they were way ahead of us. When we went to Germany first, um, they were... I mean Stockhausen, they used to play Stockhausen before we went on and stuff like that, which is just purely sound, you know, so I mean they were, and when you played in Germany at those days, you'd play town halls with like 3,000 hippies in there, all smoking dope, mm. all out of the reds, and you suddenly thought, whoa, this is, what's going on here, and this is terrific. But then you come back to Britain, and it wouldn't be any of those kind of scenes in Britain. It's too straight. It yeah. would be Cooks Ferry and yeah. play into like two two people and a dog. Yeah. So who were you looking to at that point? Who who were you looking at and listening to? The main things were Hendrix and and Zappa. Yeah. And Zappa, I mean, opened her eyes to God knows what. Brilliant, absolutely brilliant, but as well as, as Hendrix was. So they were there. It was the Beatles, Hendrix, and Zappa for us. on twice but obviously with people like John Peel around the Secret Garden and all that you're picked up by John Peel and doing a session with him yeah we did a few John Peel sessions although we never met him he was always John his producer he was never there I met him later on yeah to thank him so was he a fan yes he loved yes he didn't play anything he wasn't a fan of and I, I met him in the speakeasy, which was the watering hole of the, of the musical classes. You know, after the gig, they all go down the speakeasy and it didn't come alive till about 11 o'clock at night. 
So I, I went to the speakeasy and he was sitting at the bar drunk as a newt he was. And I went up and I said, we've never met, I said, but I'm Dick and, and you've been playing our stuff before and but thank you for playing all our stuff. And he said, he turned to me and he said, do you like the S? I said, bunch of crap. He said, I think that too. So we we had this conversation about all the bands we hated. Iceberg came and went and you're back into man, you know, there's this jumping in and out all the time. Yeah. But then we were talking about America and you did get the opportunity, you did go. Yeah. By then we went with United Artists Records and um, the records started to be released in America. So we went over and we we did tours with bands like um, the Blue Oyster Cult, Ari Over Speedwagon. Uh, and it was, it was just an eye opener. I got a map of India on my wall. I got a map of India on my wall. We started improvising because what, what, what? When we arrived, we had a, a, an hour-long set because this is what we played in Britain. But when we got there, we were we were literally told you got to play four hours. Wow. So what we did was, we in rather than learn new songs, we played the songs you already played, but then we extended the solo sections, and gradually it got to the point where the solo sections overwhelmed the rest of the stuff. So we started right in. But it was that was the that was the reason we started improvising was because we didn't have long enough. Yeah. A lot of people see that time as the kind of sellout of 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 rock in a way. It became yeah, rock yeah. pop. Did were yeah. you seeing that? Were you thinking this is, this is you know we can see what's going on here or didn't you really mind? You well, know? we just went our sweet way. Whether yeah. we, we 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 kind of. We were quite arrogant about it. We thought we were bloody great. Mm. And I must admit, so did I. You know, at the time we were flying at just improvisation and, and kind of driving rock. Yeah. And all these commercial side of things, you were avoiding that to a certain extent. Yeah. You were going your own way, you yeah. were doing your own thing. Yeah. Um, do, do you think if you'd have gone down that route, we'd have seen man now sort of, you know, Huge back catalogs, lots of dosh, you know, world fame and so on. In in that way, <laughs> probably, yeah. You didn't sell out. No, we didn't sell out, and I'm paying for it to this day. Mm. You know, I mean, yeah, we could have gone that route, mm. but we weren't interested in going that. That wasn't what the band was all about. You know, you can't. You can I don't think you can. If you can change. If you can pander to the market, then I think it devalues the music, which is why I'm a pauper. Mm. You're back to your roots, you're back in Llanetli, and you're in the library on the 12th? 12th, yes, yes. Yeah. What can we expect? Well, what I'm I'm doing at the moment is because the man band have been dying off, you know, Mickey Jones is gone, Clive John is gone, and... Uh, so, really speak, I'm playing gigs with um, Mickey's son George Jones, his band Son of Man, who do man stuff. And it's great, they're, they're really good musicians. And uh, I really enjoy playing with them. But I also, um, I'm also putting an iceberg together again in the new year. I've got um, a record deal, which I, I thought I'd had my last record deal, but I got a record deal. So once that's, that record's made, I'll, I'll form um, a nice book and go back out on the road again. Hopefully there'll be some sort of renaissance that I'll get in under the wire just before I die, probably. Never too old to rock and roll, but you're too young to die. Yeah. Okay. Amen. Dick Leonard, thank you very much for speaking to The Herald. Thank, thank you. you.